This is a picture of one of the most significant chapels in Rome. It's based on tradition. It's not as fancy as the Basilica for St. Peter. It's called the Quo Vadis Chapel. It's believed that this place, there was a spot where Peter has this vision of the Lord coming to him. And when Peter sees the Lord, because Peter's headed out in Rome, because Nero's persecuting, when Peter has this vision of Jesus, he says, Quo Vadis, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replies in this vision to Peter, well, I'm going to Rome. Nero's persecuting my followers. I'm going to encourage those being martyred. Uh, then he asks this question of Peter. Quo Vadis, Peter, where are you going? Well, up to that point, Peter was leaving Rome to avoid persecution. He turns his life around, goes back into Rome. Tradition has that he dies at the hands of Nero after that. He's crucified upside down because he doesn't want to be crucified like Jesus. The question is a good one. Where are you going? The, the question is a difficult one after a time of failure. It feels like we've blown it. It feels like the, the kind of the circle of our life is just on a downward spiral. And we wonder if we can ever get back from that. Is it possible to recover from an epic failure? Is it possible to move forward in life when it feels like our life is defined by failure? And if anybody would know that, it would be Peter. Because when Jesus is being tried and as he goes to the cross, Peter is known for three things. And all the same, he denies Jesus once, twice, three times. If that wasn't bad enough, he boasted that that would never happen. Might happen to those other guys, Jesus, but it's not going to happen to me. And yet the story of Peter doesn't end with that epic failure. It moves forward. We've been working through the gospel of Luke and his account of Jesus' road from the Garden of Gethsemane to hanging on the cross, to paying the price for our sins. And this morning we're going to look at, at Peter and his three denials of Jesus and how his life gets turned around. What's unique in Luke's account of this, you'll see on the gold insert in your order of service. I invite you to take notes on this morning's message. Use this week's Grow, Pray, Study Guide. And there's one spot where Luke says something that none of the other gospel writers record. It's in verse 61. Look what it says here. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. That's after the third denial, by the way. Before we take a closer look at that look that Jesus gave, let's first go to our great God in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you know exactly where we are going in life and you walk with us. So we look at the story of Peter's greatest failure. Help us to see how you meet us in our failure and bring your forgiveness and loving presence. We praise you that amid Peter's denials, weighed down with our sins, you went to the cross and gave your life that we might have life. Holy Spirit, meet us in our failure. Move us forward with faith and forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The British did a study of 500 what they called charmed people. That meant that they were wealthy. That meant that they were successful. That meant that they had great relationships. They were curious how, how these people, these 500, had kind of gotten to the top of the the latter, so to speak, successful, socially strong relationships, good life. How, how, how did they get there? It turned out they all had one trait in common. They all had turned bad into good. At some point, they had experienced failure in life. Some might even say an epic failure, but had turned it around, had found a path towards success. In Peter's life, he's one of Jesus' top three disciples. And yet, on that night, 
it seems like he has an epic failure. He turns his life around. What, what do you do when that happens? What, what do you do to turn life around after an epic failure? Well, you make the pivot. You make a pivot. Now, this is Kobe Bryant. For most people in basketball, you get two steps, or it's called trial. Kobe got like five, I think, in his career. And you make this pivot. You turn around and see what God has done. You turn around, because in basketball, when you make a pivot, that means that one foot has to stay planted. You can move your other foot and throw the pass this way, or you can move your foot that way, but my left foot has stayed planted the whole time. If I move that foot, that's called traveling. When we fail, we often think all our options are gone. Life is over. What, what are we going to do next? But when, when you make the pivot, you understand that, that there is another option. This morning, we'll briefly look at five different pivots that we see in this story that what happens to Peter, we too can move forward from failure. That God does desire to do a great work in our life. Here's the first one. God knows our weaknesses. Jesus knew it was coming. He was not caught off guard that Peter denied him three times. He even told him it was coming. Look what it says here in verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus warns Peter he will fail. And Peter experiences failure Friday. One denial. Two denials. Don't you think he should have left at that point? Three denials. He experiences that pain. And yet Jesus wasn't caught off guard by that. You might think, well, Jesus prayed this prayer. It didn't turn out that way. Je Jesus didn't pray that Peter would not fail. Jesus prayed that that failure would not end his faith. Jesus prays for that failure to be redeemed. You might think that, that Jesus was disappointed in Peter. To disappoint somebody, it means to say that I've got a set of expectations and you didn't meet them. But Jesus didn't put Peter up here. Jesus knew that Peter was going to be like way down here. You can never disappoint God. God knows you. God knows your strengths and your weaknesses. God knows where you're going to fail and where you're going to succeed. God knows where you're going to hurt yourself, others, and your relationship with God. But he doesn't give up on you. He doesn't say game over. He invites you to make a pivot. To understand that God knows our weaknesses. He invites you to make a second pivot as well. God sees our secrets. You might be able to hide to the rest of the world on Facebook what life is really doing to you. On Facebook, everything looks wonderful. But deep within your hurt, there's a hurt from failure. There is pain that is there. You know you've done wrong. And that hurts and God sees that. He sees our secrets. Again, what's unique to Luke's account of Peter denying Jesus the three times? Look what it says here in verse 61. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Only Luke tell, tells us that, that Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. Have you, have you ever thought about what, what were Jesus' eyes like? What, were they burning with vengeance? Or were they burning with tears? Was he hurt by what Peter said? We're not told what was in that look. Was, was it judgment? Was it disappointment? I don't think so. Did he roll his eyes at Peter? Say, I told you so. I don't think that was there at all. I think what he was saying was, I'm still here for you. I know you have failed me. 
but it's not the end of our relationship together. Peter, I know your weaknesses. I know your secrets. I want you to know that that I still love you. God knows our weaknesses. God sees our secrets. And we are invited to make a third pivot. God welcomes our repentance. God welcomes the opportunity for us to say, my life was going in the wrong direction, Lord. (laughs) I need to turn that life around. I need to come back to you. The temptation is to say, I'm not that bad. Well, it turns out I actually am. Look what happens here for for Peter, following that look here. Uh, Verses 61 and 62. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. The temptation is to say, well, I'm not that bad. But God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows the good that's in our life. But he knows the bad as well. That bad that surfaces in attitudes and actions. That separates us from him. That separates us from others. That it feels it tears us up inside as well. Sin is a word that's just not too popular in our society today. We'd rather use a nicer word. We, I'm sorry, I, I just made a mistake. We, we, we all make mistakes, don't we? I'm, I'm, I'm just a mistaker. I, I, I'll get it next time. That would be nice, but I, I'm a sinner. I need that forgiveness. I need to recognize that with me. I need to be honest with myself. And when you look deep within your heart and you see what separates us from God, that's why part of our worship service, we we provide a moment where where we kind of look at our past week, past day, past hour, and say, God, this is what I've done. This is where I failed to do. This is what's so beautiful in this meeting. Now, for Peter, he cries bitter tears, we're told. Peter wept bitterly. He understood that he didn't just make a mistake here. He had sinned here once, twice, three times. And especially after being prideful and saying, hey, those guys will, I never will. It's not even probably 12 hours later. It might not even be six hours later. He hasn't even kept that commitment. And yet those tears for Peter reflect a path of repentance. Because repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, like I'm sorry I got caught. Repentance is saying, I'm sorry I did it in the first place. I need your forgiveness, God. And when you pivot and understand that God knows our weaknesses, God sees our secrets, and God welcomes repentance... There's a fourth pivot. God offers forgiveness. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. Because death isn't the end of Jesus' story. The story continues with resurrection. In Mark's account of what happens on that Easter morning as As news starts to go out that Jesus has risen from the dead, the the women come back from the tomb. They can't understand exactly why there's a missing body. And and they met met an angel or angels, and they come back with a message. Look Look at what Mark says here in chapter 16, verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter. What must have it been felt like to have been singled out by Jesus? Do you think Peter felt fear or love? What what if you put your name in the place of Peter? The angel saying, go tell his disciples, and then your name speaking to you. Wherever that failure's been in your life, whatever has caused some distance between you and God or, or you and others, 
Jesus knows our shortcomings, and yet he still embraces us. One other post-Easter kind of encounter with Jesus takes place in John's gospel account. Jesus asks the same question of Peter three times, and that number is significant. Look what it says here in John 21, 17. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? By asking that question three times, do you love me? Jesus is kind of confronting the elephant in the room. Yes, I know you denied me three times. Remember, I saw you that night. But he's also affirming that that's not the end of Peter's story. That forgiveness has indeed been offered to Peter. Jesus expresses his love to us by giving his life on a cross that our sins might be forgiven. That's what we celebrate in this meal. That's what we receive as a gift in this meal. And we demonstrate our love to God by caring for others. By expressing that forgiveness to them. By experiencing that love that God has for us. Uh, Will Smith is a great actor. He's had some hit movies. Hitch and like the whole Men in Black series. And yet he made one movie after Earth. I won't embarrass you by asking if you paid money to go see that. I watched it on Netflix I think. And I remember looking at it and go, well, I'm glad we didn't pay money for that one. Not many people went to see it. it uh, the critics didn't like it, which wouldn't hurt so bad. The public didn't like it. It, it didn't make much. He had made that movie with his son, and it was one of his first flops. And he got interviewed by Variety magazine about, about that experience. Not, not about, hey, how great was it to be in Men in Black and Hitch, but what did you experience when you realize that After Earth had not made it as a hit. And he told the person that was interviewing uh, kind of an interesting response. He said, when I was 15 years old, my girlfriend dumped me. And I thought to myself, if I'm always at the top, if I'm always number one, no one will ever not love me. I will always be loved. And then he said, after making after earth and it came out and it didn't do well it was a Monday he was on a treadmill for 90 minutes I don't know why anybody would want to do that one <laughs> and then it hit him only love is going to fill that hole he had looked for it up here in success but in failure he discovered only love is going to fill that hole Th this is what he said to the interviewer you can't win enough, you can't have enough money, you can't succeed enough. There is not enough. The only thing that will ever satiate that existential thirst is love. And I just remember that day I made the shift from wanting to be a winner to wanting to have the most powerful, deep, and beautiful relationships I could possibly have. When God offers forgiveness... When Jesus meets us in this meal, he brings love to fill the hole, to fill it to overflowing. God offers forgiveness, and that leads to a fifth pivot. God gives a fresh start. Failure does not have to be the end of your story. Failure is not where you're to build a monument and regret what has happened in the past. Forgiveness is the path forward to embracing life. Just think of how God used Peter in the book of Acts. So Jesus rises from the dead. At some point he has this conversation, do you love me? For about 40 days Jesus keeps showing up on earth and then at one point on day 40, he says, you stay in Jerusalem, you pray, and then he ascends to heaven. Ten days later, his followers are gathered together in a large room. This, this wind comes in, and all of a sudden they are equipped with the Holy Spirit. Just, just think how, how God is using Peter in this moment. The disciples all of a sudden are able to tell the faith story in another language, 
It's what we call Pentecost. It's this large Jewish feast. Jews from all around the world had gathered in Jerusalem, and yet the disciples don't speak to them in Hebrew or Aramaic. They speak in their language, their heart language, their, their native tongue. Languages they would not have known, but are now empowered to speak of who this great God is. And the spokesman that day is Peter. Peter talks about how Jesus had come, how he was a good man. How the Jews had arrested him and had crucified him. How God raised him from the dead. In fact, he just doesn't say the Jews, he said, you crucified. But God raised him from the dead. And at least 3,000 people are moved to ask this question of Peter. What do we do now? Look at what he says here in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Look at how Peter has learned from his failure how he embraces forgiveness. Peter knew what it meant to fail. But even more, he knows the forgiveness of Jesus. That that's a message that is to be shared. He leverages his worst moment. And God turns it into his best moment. Now, Peter won't live a perfect life after this point. It would be nice if it turned out that way. But Peter, just like the rest of us, will continue to stumble and fall and fail and find forgiveness and share that message. Failure does not have to define your life. Forgiveness can redefine your life for, for a fresh start. That's true in Peter's day. That's true in our day. The name Chuck Negron may not mean much to you. His group might, Three Dog Night. That was a big group when I was growing up. And they had like all kinds of hits, an old-fashioned love song. And the one I remember is Joy to the World. Our bus driver would let us, when I was in middle school, would let somebody play that, and we'd all be singing in the bus. That's not the Christmas version, by the way. This has got fishes in the deep blue sea, and joy to you and me, and just a cute little song. Uh, Nick, he was at the top of his, the rock and roll game. 11 top 10 hits. 50 million records sold. You would think life would just be wonderful for this guy, that, that he had made it. And yet at some point he picked up an addiction to heroin. And with that addiction to heroin, uh, he, he tried to fight it. He, he went to rehab. One time, three times, five times, ten times. He had 35 hospital stays and couldn't kick the habit. And he still kept going. 40 times, 50 times, 60 times, 70 times, 80 times, 90 times, 100 times to rehab. And he couldn't kick the habit. Three Dog Night had become Three Dog Nightmare for this guy. That's the name of his book about this experience. And about 20 years ago, he went back again. Went to a place called Cry Help. I don't think it's a Christian organization. But instead of just trying harder, this time he, he decided to trust Jesus. And for 20 years, he's been drug-free. He's 76 now, still rock and rolling. And helping people with, with drug counseling and some of the other issues in life. And yet when you look at Peter's life and when you look at Chuck Negron's life, consider the score. Denials. Peter 0 for 3 doesn't affirm knowing who Jesus is. Chuck Negron kicking the habit. 0 for 100 at least. And trying to kick that horrible addiction. What, what's your failure spot? What keeps tripping you up? Maybe you're ready to throw in the towel. Maybe you think that if I just try harder, I can get my way through this. 
But for Mr. O for 3 and for Mr. O for 100, it's not about trying harder. It's about trusting in Jesus. And when we take our failure and we bring it to Jesus, because of what he's done on the cross, because of what he offers in this meal, he says, I've got this. Even better, he says, I've got you. So whatever that failure is, whatever that need is, quo vadis, where are you going? Don't let your failure become a stopping point. Let it mark a fresh new start. God knows your weaknesses. God knows your secret sins. God welcomes repentance. God offers forgiveness. And our God, he's so great, he gives fresh starts. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, you know our weaknesses and our secret sins, and still you look at us in love. Holy Spirit, move our heart from merely trying harder to trusting Jesus more. Move us forward from our failures and sins along the road of repentance with the gift of forgiveness Jesus brings on the cross. Pivot our lives to the fresh start you can give in Jesus' death and resurrection for us. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you've got this, even more that you've got us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.